you guys per usual everything on this channel is for educational purposes only and is not intended as financial advice so a few of you have asked for this this is a follow-up to my other fundamentals video i'll probably do one about every six months that's when the last one was recorded it's philip francis on twitter posted this great tweet basically uh stealing my thunder talking about everything i'm gonna say in about 140 characters so uh this is me in case you're not seeing this on uh youtube or whatever telegram is really the best way to get a hold of me so most of this is going to be some basic stuff some like thousand foot view and some like hundred foot view stuff so really what are fundamentals according to investopedia.com they are intrinsic value indicators as well as like fit in macro and micro economic conditions basically so when i think about bitcoin i really think about why i'm in bitcoin at all when i'm thinking about fundamentals uh, and regarding that this is the best sort of explanation it has some flaws but overall it's basically free <laughs> people are gonna hate me saying that uh, it's private it's secure it's almost instant it's open source it's worldwide peer-to-peer -peer. it's public anybody can view the ledger decentralized distributed no chargebacks which means lower incidence of fraud if not zero uh, now obviously there are ways around that uh, and then lastly it's pseudonymous not anonymous uh, which is where the personal information piece kind of gets flimsy so overall what i'm going to be talking about in this google slideshow uh, i'll link that up in the description in the slideshow in the show notes there are a ton of links uh, with sources and extra information for things i'm saying if anybody wants to delve into it further um, so basically when i'm looking at fundamentals of bitcoin i'm looking at the network as a whole i'm looking at how coins are generated uh, i'm looking at the future of the development in this case protocol changes um, i'm also looking at micro macroeconomic stuff and some like outlier things like etfs are concerned uh, and i'm not going to talk about the other etfs that are on the way around the world but there are definitely multiple etfs in the works london hong kong besides just the winklevoss etf so total bitcoins in circulation uh, for anyone in bitcoin a long time this is nothing new this is one of the biggest draws of bitcoin it has a limited supply fixed supply, controlled supply, however you want to say that. That works through reward halvings every 210,000 blocks. So that's super scheduled versus central bank or centralized entity who can adjust and demonetize and deflate and inflate. So the block reward halving just happened. The next one will be in approximately July 2020. That can adjust up and down depending on the hash rate. So we'll see you then. From there, it'll decrease from 12.5 to 6 coins, 6.25. On the last video, the last fundamental video, that was kind of the big overarching theme that the having was coming and we'd expect with a decrease in supply an increase in price so long as demand is about the same or greater uh, which is basically what has happened whether or not it is real demand i don't know probably you can argue that um, it's also interesting to look at who owns how much bitcoin so which addresses have x balance and for the most part most of the bitcoin between 10 and 10,000. this doesn't mean that you know one person can have any number of wallets but in a single wallet usually between 10 and 10,000, about 75 percent let's say so not many people overall not many addresses overall own bitcoin which is interesting less than 70 million addresses uh, so market cap is the total value so for the market cap you just take the total number of bitcoins in circulation, multiply by the current price and boom you get the market cap you can see we broke out of the previous all-time high in market cap not necessarily all-time high in price the reason the market cap is higher even when the price is lower is because there are more coins in circulation why is that important well if you compare it to countries their gdp and fortune 500 companies you can sort of see where we fit into this bitcoin's bigger than twitter now that's sort of things to consider with a bigger market cap events that alter price are less relevant so i think of it as a the pond overall is getting bigger the bitcoin pond so it's, it takes bigger splashes to influence the entire ecosystem so the bigger the market cap the better as far as stability of the ecosystem is concerned so now some super basic stuff how are bitcoins generated um, and i'm explaining this so i can explain sort of the rest of the fundamental aspects of it so mining is basically solving the algorithm that creates the blocks blocks are the units of code that compromise the chain uh, and with each new block uh, it gets linked to the block before it hence creating the blockchain uh, and the hash rate is the speed at which the computing power is happening so the higher the hash rate 
of an individual or an entity, the higher the probability of finding the next block. Uh, and then difficulty changes depending on total hash rate. That's related to block time, which I'll explain on another slide. So that adjusts approximately every two weeks, 2,000 blocks. Uh, another thing to consider, block size debate, I'm not going to get into it, uh, but basically there's a hard cap on the total block size of Bitcoin right now at one megabyte. So you can fit a bunch of stuff into the Bitcoin transaction, so multiple people can, up to one megabyte. You can see overall we've gotten higher and higher and higher across time since 2015, and we're sort of knocking on the ceiling of the total block size. The reason that's important is because if block size is full, that means transactions will get left out of the block. Transactions left out of the block will be the transactions that have the lowest fee. So this is where problems with fees uh, come into play. The idea would be then that fees would go up because everyone is trying to get into the block. So anyone with a lower fee gets excluded from the block. And here's just another representation of that. You can see number of transactions per block increasing since 2015, which follows suit with the block size overall. And most importantly, I think out of anything mining related is the hash rate. Hash rate has gone up. This is, this is over all time. It looks kind of weird because it's in log, but this hash rate shows you that the network as a whole is super, super secure because it's quote unquote distributed, even though most of it's in China. Overall, it shows you that the network is constantly being fed more and more hashing power, more and more ability to solve the Bitcoin al algorithm, which in turn makes the entire network more secure because the more entities involved, the more secure the network. As hash rate goes up, difficulty goes up. Um, so difficulty adjusts so that block time is about 10 minutes. Here's another way to see that. You can see as hash rate goes up every 2,000 blocks, the difficulty adjusts. It can go up and down with hash rate. It can be gamed so that if somebody drops a bunch of hash rate at the very last second, you know, at the very last few blocks, uh, it'll drop the difficulty artificially. And inversely, if they increase mining power at the very end, like the last so many blocks, it'll artificially inflate the difficulty, therefore making block time longer than it should be until the next difficulty adjustment. So you can see 600 seconds is 10 minutes, uh, and the network will continually aim for 10 minutes. Uh, so it, it will adjust difficulty accordingly so that the hash rate makes it to 10 minutes per block. And that's one of the uh, most important aspects of Bitcoin as a whole. Why those numbers exist the way they are, there's some reasoning behind that that Satoshi put in the white paper I'm not going to go into. Um, this is from 21.co showing you fees of the last certain amount of transactions, 72 hours in the mempool, 24 hours in the uh, total transactions. So you can think of the entire network as sort of like a highway. So if the highway fills up, the mempool fills up, meaning the backlog of transactions fills up, and fees generally get higher because people want to get in the blocks, right? So if your fee is low, you're not going to get in the blocks. All these people, now generally a wallet that knows what it's doing will auto include any fee, any exchange or Coinbase or anything like that will auto include a fee appropriate for the network at the time for the most part or will overshoot it. Now, if you want to include your transaction quickly, you put in a higher fee. If you don't care, you put in just the average fee. Uh, if you're using like a, the most basic wallet, I don't even know, like QT wallet or something. Um, I don't even know anymore. Um, but I think there you can adjust the uh, fee accordingly. You can see these people with no fee are just kind of chilling. So you don't want to be down there. And uh, this shows you what the estimated delay in blocks is and uh, in time. It's a pretty cool website to look at if you're ever, you know, like a time crunch for fees. I've never really been in that position. I was at Best Buy when I was trying to buy a Chromebook using Gift. It's probably the only time in my life where uh, I was like in a crunch for waiting on that. But uh, anyway, so mempool I mentioned already, it's kind of like the size of the, the fullness of the highway in the network. So if mempool is full, mempool is full, that tells you that uh, there's a lot of backlog. There's a lot of stuff waiting to be uh, sent through the network. And this can also be gamed by spam sending spam transactions low amount of bitcoin but high volume of transactions kind of like a ddos type deal so protocol changes these are exciting not everybody likes all of these specifically bitcoin jesus roger ver but it is what it is segwit is the most relevant one currently protocol change uh, basically all of these are addressing block size and scalability uh, there's a great 
less than two minute video by 99 bitcoins in the, the uh, show notes watch that that's what i stole for the this bit here uh, basically what segwit does is decrease the file size of the transaction which would increase the total transactions per block it does not increase total block size so hard block size would ceiling would stay at one megabyte and this happens with a soft fork through 95 percent minor f approval now a block size increase would require a hard fork which has its own problems just look to ethereum and any other coin that has had to hard fork and to explain uh segwit again so bitcoin transactions have three parts a sender a receiver and a signature and what segwit does is remove the signature from the transaction that's how it decreases the file size of the transaction and you might be thinking isn't the signature really important for the transaction it is. I don't know how it goes about removing the transaction signature from the transaction and still making it secure, uh, but you can definitely read the white paper in the show notes. Uh, so Lightning Network and Rootstock are two more protocol improvements, changes. I don't know if changes is the right word, but probably improvements. I guess improvements is the wrong word too, depending on <laughs> that has a connotation to it. We're going to say changes. So Lightning Network, what it is, is an off-chain instant bi-directional payment channel. I don't think miners like this because they're losing on mining fees, but users like this because if I'm interacting with one person multiple times or uh, forever, for instance, if I'm just sending stuff back and forth, you can just keep that channel open. Uh, and then Rootstock, uh, which I know the least about, is a uh, smart contracts on a side chain. I'm not going to go into side chains, but uh, again, they're part of block size scalability issues. So if we go to SegWit support, I said it needed 95% in order for the soft fork to activate. Currently sitting, uh, actually, Coin.Dance has us at 29%. Um, blockchain has us at 26.5%. So it's getting there. It might take some time. Again, there's politics with that that I'm not going to go into. So probably one of the most important things for fundamentals is just uh, mainstream awareness uh, when we talk about adoption and you know people who aren't in the bitcoinosphere like us so recently we hit a thousand again all these articles popped up these are just the ones i pulled off of uh, bitcoin subreddit so the purpose that you know what these really do are increase uh, google trends for bitcoin search and blockchain search so again that brings people into the fold let's say you know, it's, it kind of incorrectly says you can make a lot of money really quickly, <laughs> uh, which you can, but most people getting it into it for the first time don't. For instance, when I got into it for the first time back in 2013, around 500, you know, I, people are going to get burned again buying at these levels for the first time, but we'll see. The next thing, the ETF. So I talked about the ETF in the last fundamental video. Uh, basically, ETF is an exchange traded fund where they would have to buy Bitcoin. So the general idea is that this would lift off Bitcoin price similar to how it did for the gold ETF, the SPDR ETF. Then I just listed some Twitter accounts for you to follow should you be interested in getting the latest and the greatest in the coin ETF. Demonetization has been happening worldwide uh, as to the reasoning why the governments are using generally to decrease corruption, child trafficking, basically prevent the bad guys from using cash. Um, I've got a lot of links on here you can check out. This is an older website, uh, about two years ago, a year ago, listing country by country what might be happening. Uh, Australia recently discussing removing the $100 note. Uh, India, big deal happened. Everybody should be aware about that, uh, possibly on gold as well. Spain just uh, outlawed transactions over a thousand euro, cash transactions specifically. Uh, and Venezuela, just like India, has done a lot of voiding and reissuing. So the question becomes, will the United States follow suit. Uh, I think they will with the higher denominations. I don't even know the higher denominations. The $1,000 note, I guess. Note, $1,000 bill <laughs> um, in the U.S. I don't I don't know if it'll go as far as the $100 bill, but there's, there's a lot of scaremongering and anybody trying to sell you a guide on how to avoid the end of the world, probably not the best website to take into account. But uh, I like this Michael Casey article talking about how Trump might end the dollar. Basically, one of the reasons being he hates the Fed or says he hates the Fed. So we'll see what happens there. Um, and this is just a look at USDC and H. So this is offshore yuan. I don't know the difference between offshore and onshore yuan. I don't really care. The point is that the Chinese are devaluing their currency and money is moving to other places such as uh, digital assets, Bitcoin. Um, and so this is offshore. This is onshore. You can see the value of the, the Chinese currency decreasing. Um, 
U so the US dollar is getting more powerful. And then this is just a zero hedge chart showing uh, as USD CNY is decreasing, uh, Bitcoin's really taken off. Here's another uh, Wall Street Journal chart showing uh, onshore, offshore, Yuan. I don't really understand the different intricacies, nor do I care, but that's something to look into if you're interested. And then a few additional things regarding capital controls. Uh, China's closing Forex loopholes as well. Uh, interesting article there. And pretty interesting that uh, Swiss bank banking secrecy is ending. A few articles on that. Uh, basically, as of September 2018, I think they're changing any sort of secret account into like a database where any country can uh, look at what's going on, specifically India, in one of the articles. So that's all I have on fundamentals. If you have any questions, comments, complaints, hit me up in the comment section of YouTube, Twitter, or Telegram. Also, if I botched something, let me know. If I said something incorrectly, let me know. If you're in one of those countries where the demonetization is happening, let me know. I'd be really interested and curious to either talk to you on Twitter or Telegram or even on a YouTube hangout just about your experience and what's going on with that. Uh, as always, like, dislike, comment, share, subscribe, donate, and happy trading.